Hi, and welcome to Turning Point School of Art. I'm Professor Sarah Pertz, and this is our Art and Nature Summer School 2021. Art and Nature, where to start? We've seen depictions of all aspects of nature from the very earliest of art forms, and many of the well-known images from the grand canon of art history involve nature. Here's some people bathing in nature, Van Gogh out in his garden, Monet and Turner produce landscape after landscape. You get the idea. Everyone's favorite Frida Kahlo was rarely depicting herself without birds and monkeys. And moreover, Kahlo studied Mexico's native plants and used their symbolic and historical meanings in her paintings, as well as their chemical and therapeutic properties in real life. We see nature depicted in art across all four corners of the world and across all time periods. Let's look to one of my favorite art history movements, the Pre-Raphaelites. These really wanted to go back to earlier forms of nature and were influenced by the leading critic, John Ruskin, who told them all, go to nature, reject nothing, selecting nothing and scorning nothing. So they wanted to get back to nature in a big way. Rather annoyingly, they are often referred to as the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, but there were plenty of sisters too. Look at this fantastic study of sunflowers by Barbara Lee Smith Bodichon. Victorians were a bit obsessed with natural history and nature is often the context for locating their characters. This watercolor by Lizzie Siddle is based on an old Scottish ballad. In this scene, the group realized that a great storm has destroyed the ship returning from Norway that was bringing the king, his daughter, and all the court back to them. The figure on the left is Lizzie herself. We know fairly well what she looks like as she was painted often by Rossetti. And here again, I presume a self-portrait in the haunted wood and very likely an exploration of her feelings at the time. So little is known about Emma Sanders, who died age 34 in 1877. But looking at this amazing image, it's made all the more stronger for the inclusion of the rose. I can't even find a definite date for this work, but it's often found hanging in Birmingham Art Gallery if you happen to be near there. Photography too was a real hit in these times. Check out Anna Atkins, widely considered to be the first person to make a book of photographs. She trained as an illustrator, but then began to experiment with photographic chemicals and processes. And I absolutely love her images of British algae. These are cyanotypes made by chemicals and UV light. These are literally blueprints. The same process was used by architects to make copies of plans. In the 20th century, Imogen Cunningham is a well-known photographer who transforms again how we see botanicals in photography, through her use of light and close-up detail. There's been a bit of an explosion of exhibitions looking at nature in the last few years, and I'm sure it's a trend that won't go away as the global pandemic makes us reflect on the power of nature at its worst and at its best, and importantly, our role as humans to protect, recover, and sustain our environments. For this year's design biennial, artistic director Ez Devlin created a forest in the courtyard of Somerset House in London. She was told that when the house was built 250 years ago, trees were not allowed. So she's inserted these for a limited time and to draw attention to the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and their plan to change the world by 2030. Forest for Change also includes a soundtrack of birdsong, curated by musician Brian Eno from the British Library Sound Archive. And there's a commitment to replant these trees in London boroughs afterwards. Around the same time, artist duo Ackroyd and Harvey took their artwork called On the Shore from the floor of Tate Modern's Turbine Hall and launched it onto the River Thames. They spent the days before this launch actually growing the piece blocking out some of the parts to light in order to reveal the words of award-winning writer Ben Ockrey. Can't you hear the future weeping? Our love must save the world. So far, so good. An important message about climate change and launched by Ockrey's daughter, 
singing with the London Capital Children's Choir, accompanied on guitar by Damon Alban. To save humans ruining the artwork, never mind the environment, how about an artwork made by trees that owns and runs itself? Terra Zero is an artwork that, while started by humans, has now become autonomous. Over time, it's a forest that sells its raw materials by giving out service contracts to humans. And with this new capital, it buys itself more land and so more raw materials. All this is possible using blockchain technology. The Terra Zero initiators use the open source Ethereum network, which is the second most popular after Bitcoin. So the forest is autonomous because it's a digital decentralized smart contract on the blockchain, basically. Rachel Pym's work also explores relationships between technology, value, and nature. Their piece called The Great Exhibition of the Work of Cash Crops looks at plants that have been produced for their commercial value. They create a living installation that takes plants' biodata and translates it into a soundscape using something that the artist calls a midi sprout. Artist Maria Teresa Alves has turned her work called To See the Forest Standing into an ongoing campaign about the threat of the forest in the state of Accra, Brazil, under threat by both big business and the government. In her 19 channel video installation, she highlights the association of the movement of indigenous agroforestry agents of the state of Accra by interviewing the people on the front line of deforestation. Zheng Bo was an artist known for his social practice when one day in 2013, he was woken up by a patch of vibrant weeds on the former site of the Shanghai cement factory, now known as the West Bund. He says the plants, insect and soil called him into action and he claimed the site as his artwork so that it would not be bulldozed and paved over to become a plaza for human only concerts. From then on, he changed to ecological practice. His series here brings together drawings of trees and weeds that Zheng Bo encountered over the 24 solar terms of the Chinese zodiac calendar over one year. Artist Collective Cooking Sections made a performative installation at Tate Britain called Salmon, a Red Herring. It highlights how farm salmon is fed with unnatural synthetic pigments to make them the color pink that people expect. As part of this, Tate removed farm salmon off its restaurant and cafe menus and introduced a climavore dish instead. In Mikhail Karakis's work, No Ordinary Protest, he works with a group of seven-year-olds from a London primary school over the course of a year, and they work with sound experiments and explore its power as a way to both represent changing landscapes and also to become activists. The video of the project shows their increased awareness of responsibility towards the environment and the need for solidarity with the creatures. <laughs> Ages ago, the philosopher Aristotle once wrote, art not only imitates nature, but it also completes its deficiencies. Suffice to say, art can help us to see and experience nature in whole new ways, and perhaps also offer us some hope in our ongoing mission to save this beautiful planet.